And we're off. Think we're good to go? Okay, everybody, welcome to my classroom. I'm John Tucker, um, and I will confess this is the second time now that I have gone through a bit of a, an awkward exercise. Um, the awkward exercise being that of uh, reflection and introspection. So a few years ago, I was lucky enough to be asked to, or it was suggested that, uh, that I apply for uh, the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching. And we at the Marine Institute, this was the first time that we had an opportunity to uh, apply for this, for this award. And uh, there's a few differences. I mean, we do things a little differently up there. So we never had to keep portfolios or anything like that. And so I, I was told I had to prepare a portfolio, a teaching portfolio. And in the preparation of that portfolio, I will confess that it was quite painful. Um, and the reason it was painful was because uh, I had always been a bit of a, a natural. I, I have from some international friends whose English isn't quite so good. They call me John Talker. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I can basically kill a lot of time just sort of speaking. My voice is quite clear. I have good inflection. Yes, 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 yes. I'm interesting. I'm com I can crack the odd joke. But what happens is you're asked, why are you successful at teaching? And you think to yourself, well, I like it. Um, and then you sort of try to dig in a little deeper, and what makes it work? I mean, being able to entertain is one thing, but being able to communicate and get stuff across and make people want to learn it, that's the big deal. So how do we do that? A uh, bit of history about myself. I am an engineer, a professional engineer. Uh, one of my former professors is here. I'm quite honored. Thank you, Glenn, for joining us. And, um, I, I did some work in uh, telecom, telecommunications with the former, with the, the company that used to be Northern Telecom and uh, ESSO. And then I worked for the Faculty of Engineering. I was not teaching full time. I, I was teaching sessionally. However, I was quite popular on the speaker circuit. They sent me out to recru do some recruiting on occasion. And I'm comfortable in front of people. Well, as comfortable as humans can be. I don't think anybody is truly comfortable. I think you kind of have to either be able to jump off the, the diving board or you stand at the edge of the diving board and then edge your way back, one or the other. But uh, I'm a jumper. So I got used to speaking in front of people. I taught sessionally. And it was a bit of a challenge. I mean, I knew my stuff. But uh, I would walk into, I was a young man, and I would walk in with these students who were about the same age as myself, and I had to make them believe that I knew enough about this stuff that they should listen to me. And some of them had toods. You know what I'm saying? They, 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 they thought, well, what's this young fella doing here? Anyway, I was doing some sessional teaching, I was running a lab. I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to go to the Marine Institute in 1999 to teach full time. And it was kind of an interesting thing. I walked into a classroom and I, I just started to roll. And uh, it was a, a great fit. I had some great reviews and uh, almost immediately they threw me into my first distance teaching course. And I call it a distance teaching course. It was back when they had WebCT. I don't know if you recall that. Uh, but we didn't use WebCT. We had CDs. And the CDs were created for a, a, a version of Windows that had just been replaced. So we sent out all these CDs, and everybody was having a hard time running them. And uh, we didn't actually have anything. My job was to basically man the phone in my office for when people had questions about the course. Uh, that was a tough one. Now, I, I will confess. There was no real joy. I didn't teach. I was more answering the odd questions. This, 
I had another opportunity to teach a course. A, a good friend of mine was teaching an engineering economics course. And she was doing it uh, using WebCT. And what she did was she took PDFs of her notes and put them in this sh WebCT shell or course. And uh, she gave, sent out books. And she would assign questions from the back of the book as assignments. And then people would fax their assignments that they had handwritten in, and she would grade them, and she was on the phone. She was, had the office next door to me. I would listen to her on the phone, and she would handle questions from angry students, mostly, for at least four hours a day. And she was the sweetest, kindest, most generous, sold person in the world, because she could do this. And she came up to me and said, John, I'm going on vacation. I need somebody to teach this course. You're good. You can do this. And I said, OK, sure. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. So I, she said, I'll set you up with everything. I'll give you everything. So she gave me her course, all the material, all the notes, everything. It's engineering economics. I know this stuff. And uh, anyway, I started to teach it. And uh, well, I started to, to facilitate this course. And the students would read the notes, and they'd have the assignments. I was running it basically the same way she did. And all of a sudden, I started to get the phone calls. And you've seen those black and white movies where someone is standing up in the castle, and they see the winding path leading up to the castle. And there's the villagers with their torches lit, and they've got a rope. And they're walking up the door, this path to, towards the castle. And you know they're coming for you, right? I can tell you this. Um, there's two truisms in this. Number one, if students don't like the course, that's first uh, because it's not well set up. That's, that's the first thing. If it's not well set up, they won't like it. But the second thing is, if the students don't like the course, they don't like the way it's being taught, the instructor won't like teaching it. And I hated teaching that course. So I did it once. It was a bad experience. Um, and I changed my mind about a couple of things with these courses. I said, listen, you know, uh, these learners, they want to be able to bang away at questions. When I was a student, we would get together and to prepare for our applied math stuff, we would like to bang away at questions. We'd get the book. Occasionally, some, one of my peers somehow got their hands on one of these solution manuals, yeah. right? And we would get in a room we'd start doing them. Now, we would put a question on the board. We'd all try to do it. And we, somebody would figure it out. And we'd write it up on the board. And everybody would get it. And that's how we'd prepare. So we like to do exercises to learn. So I had this picture in my mind. I mean, I learned something when I started to teach. When I was a student, I didn't realize this, but we did a assignments in our courses. And they were all, if you look at the, the, the mark breakdown in the course, they were always worth very little, like 5%. So initially, it didn't even register with me what was going on. But what happened was uh, the instructors knew. They knew. What they knew was we were cheating. Me and I was. I mean, our, all of my friends and I did. The intention was that they give us these questions, and a good class would, everybody would go to their corners and individually do this work. We didn't do that. We had a lot of assignments to do. We all got together in that classroom. We all banged out. And then we had seven assignments a week, so that's what we did. Now, my thought was that initially that I would try to create different versions of the same assignment for everybody. So I set up these. Excel spreadsheets, which would permit me to randomly create questions, you know, a little randomization factor in there, and a solution. So I could go in and give everybody a unique set of questions. OK, your rectangle that you're supposed to ca calculate the area for is 3 by 4, and yours is 2 by 8, and yours is 6 by 7, et cetera, et cetera. And it would be more complicated than that. But I would give everybody the same question with different numbers. And I would grade it. A lot of work. I started to look for something to help me out. And I found something. And I found a different way of doing things. Um, it led to a lot of great development. I'm going to highlight here today for you 
But ultimately, my personal, one of my great achievements personally is that in 2012, I won the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching because of these efforts. Okay. So as I've said, the first couple of online courses were difficult. You know what I'm talking about. Now, a lot of people were saying, well, it's an online course. You've got to do it differently. And all I knew, because really, as an instructor, I did a few educational courses, but nobody ever actually sort of showed me all of the ins and outs of how to operate in a classroom. They sort of said, well, you know the material, get in there. That's, was, that's how we operate here. So I had the same experience with the distributed learning course. I, I'm an engineer. And you know what? Messing things up or getting things incorrect as an engineer is not a bad thing, unless, unless you work on a hydroelectric project. But, <laughs> but what I will say is it tells you what not to do again. So what I figured out was, hey, I'm pretty, pretty all right in a classroom. Let's try to do that. Um, so I started to create. My initial thought was, well, what makes a classroom better? So you're here now, and you're writing notes, right? Now, if you were just reading, and I'm just postulating. I'm not the brain specialist, OK? But if you're just reading my notes, like they did with the PDFs in that first offering, uh, well, it, you can get pretty sleepy. Number one, only a certain part of your brain is active, is my thought. But if you're in a classroom, hey, you're hearing this voice. Now, some voices can be pretty, you know, lull you to sleep sort of thing, admittedly. But then on top of that, you're here and you're taking notes, right? So you're acting mechanically. All of these things are making your brain more active. That's my thought. Indeed, actually, there's some theory behind this. And so I came up with my initial, they came to me about a couple of years later, and they said, Johnny, we need you to teach that engineering economics course again. And I said, oh my gosh. Uh, now, they don't ask you, do you want to teach the engineering <laughs> economics course? I, I should clarify this. They said, John, you're teaching the engineering economics course, right? And so that was just like a, a hard shot right there. But what was even more difficult, quite frankly, was the timeline. So they came up to me and told me in late November, John, Jan January 2nd, you're starting the engineering economics course. So it was like, there goes Christmas. And so what I decided to do was something different. Now, again, I was thinking about trying to uh, leverage what works for me in a classroom. So initially, I made movies. That's what I did. I made movies. I, f I figured, hey, my dulcet tones are going to get me through this. Indeed, that worked fairly well. Um, and I came up with a way to do that. Um, and then I said, well, that's, I could do this better. So instead of movies, what I'd made were interactive presentations. So my thought is this. So you're up here and you're teaching, right? Sometimes I've got my back to you. I'm not supposed to do that, but I'm up here teaching or I'm, you know, massaging the screen. And I see, so see what's going on. And I say, hey, Chris, what's the name of that course that I was just talking about? Right. See, his eyebrows went up. Now he's awake. <laughs> see that? So. My thought was, I actually do this in a classroom, right? When things are kind of getting a little slow, I say, hey, you know, here's a, it's not a difficult question. I don't want you to go away and work on it for two days. Just a little something, right? Are you paying attention? And everybody, I only have to ask one of you, sort of the Wyatt Earp kind of a theory. Hang one of them, they'll all pay attention, they'll all be in line, <laughs> right? So that's what you do in a classroom, but you know what? Uh, you can do this digitally. So I took my movies and I changed them up. I actually put these little questions in every few slides. So the thing stops. So you can't just hit play and go watch the football game. You have, it stops. It waits for you to answer a question on the last couple of slides. A couple little things. You might have to backspace, a, you know, go back a couple of slides. But it does. And it won't progress until you answer the questions. So I call these engagement questions. They're nested. Anyway, I built a course this way. 
while I was teaching other courses, it was pretty nasty business. And I was running around, and I'm all excited. And I said, hey, this is the best thing ever. This is working, because the students were loving it. I mean, the time before when this course was taught, like they had like a 40, 45 percent failure rate. Remember the torches? Now I'm down to like 10. Uh, I actually try to pass all my students. I don't move the bar, I try to get them over it, right? So I was saying, yeah, and I was running around to all my peers saying, this is great, this is awesome, you can do this. And you know what the answer was? It ain't broke, I ain't fixing it. <laughs> they could not understand, and they said, well, they asked me, they said, well, does it take a lot of work to make this thing? I said, hell yeah, <laughs> it does. But you know, once you got it made, it's good. They didn't, couldn't get their head around the concept of a little upfront work for long-term gain. Okay, so the first online lectures I built were video lectures, just straight up videos, movies they played. They so involve, evolved, excuse me, such that I created interactions. I'll show you some examples of these in a couple of minutes. And I got some software which permitted me to create algorithmic assignments and quizzes. I, did, I, I built these things for my distributed learning courses, but you know what? I used them in my face-to-face -face courses. You know those assignments I talked about? Originally, see, everybody got the same question with the same numbers. And originally, I was saying the same thing to my students that I was told, as a stu not by you, sir, you were best, okay? But, <laughs> But, but as I was told by other instructors, by my instructors, they were saying, listen, you know, do your own work, right? Now, what I'm doing is I'm giving everybody the same questions with different numbers. And I'm saying, work together, right? Don't tell them your answer because it's wrong. But when you figure out how to do it, show them how to do it. The method is important now. And we've, I have evolved the concept of the assignment from an evaluation to a teaching tool. And I made it worth more. <laughs> so I made them worth like 15, 20 percent. Because I know everybody has to do their own. Now you could have the odd student who's got a lot of scratch, might pay somebody to figure it out. Um, uh, but not likely. They're all, you know, having a hard time. It, it, it's just beneficial. And I can tell you for a fact, this is an example of a question, I can tell you for a fact that my marks, have, the marks in my courses have gotten better. Okay? So, now this is the software that I use. This is one that I like in particular because you can put like these things called dynamic labels. These are algorithmically generated numbers. And the beauty of this is not the fact that it just produces a question and an answer, but it, it will also algorithmically create and present a customized solution for each question. Okay? And that is very important. So, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can use this. I mean, when we teach students. Sometimes you don't necessarily want to go with the exact answer. Sometimes you're using table data, right? So you're not using a formula. You might have uh, the equation for the table, or for the, the data in the table. So what we can do is we can use the table data, or we can use the formula to create the table data, and then rough up the numbers so that they, the students when they, when they use the table information to create their answer, we'll put it in and it'll get marked right. This is a slick one. I've got an example of this in my little shell. I'll show you in a little bit. This is a phase diagram. This graph is determined empirically in a lab with a microscope and some metal and, and a torch or a furnace or whatever. But the idea, very simply, is that uh, this here is, not, is a something that you would draw on with a ruler to get the information you need. We uh, synthesized this graph 
and basically what I do now is I give the students a paper copy of the test. A lot of them don't even use that. They just take the, a piece of paper and put it up against the screen and mark two lines. Because you've got to get the length. So you draw a horizontal line through here, and you have to project down. So and then you need this distance and you know, that sort of thing. So they put the piece of paper up against the screen and put a little couple of marks on it and measure the line. And it works. It teaches the theory well. This one is very interesting because it is dependent on table tabular data that is very fuzzy and doesn't follow any discernible, well, any easy algorithm. Um, excuse me. So we do a lot of fancy things. And this was another one here. So what I'm going to actually show you is this was originally created in the software, but we've done something more with it. Now, I, uh, I will tell you, and I've been telling my friends here, that the technology is half of the equation. What you do with it is really, really important. OK? So I've been talking about some, some gizmos and widgets. Now, how do you use them? Well, I've got three methods primarily, more actually, but three primary ones that I use. I'll just verbally describe. The first two. I mean, we're com when you actually look up or Google or try to find out, like, how do you run a distance course? There's really not a lot on it. Like, there's asynchronous and synchronous. Um, so, when I first started teaching, remember I told you that they showed up just before the course started, and I started building this thing, the movies. And uh, I was teaching three other courses while that happened. It was kind of a an emergency situation, so they called in the fire department. That's me. And uh, anyway, I was funny. I was talking to, I think it was you, and I said uh, how, uh, well, yesterday afternoon, I was finishing off this presentation. And I said, uh, he said, well, you know, a lot of courses run that way. You just, finish, just try to stay one lecture ahead. And indeed, that's what I was faced with. I, I had PDF notes, but I, and I wanted movies. And I figured out something. For me, and I'm pretty fast at this, it takes me about 20 hours to make one hour of lecture. Now, the culture, remember, I'm going to go back to the culture. The culture in the institute did not recognize that at first. They, they sort of said, well, you're teaching, man. That's what you're here for. This is why you get, you know, you have weekends and evenings. Get busy, <laughs> right? So I, I built one of these things. And I sat down with the, my boss. And I said, listen, look at this. And I showed them the product. And they said, wow, that's pretty good. And I said, I can do the whole course this way. And they said, what do you want? <laughs> and I said, well, because they thought I was going to go after like overtime. Remember, I'm teaching three other courses. And I said, if I build this, I just want to be the guy who teaches it. Don't just, don't, don't go giving this to, I mean, when it's required, give me the course if I want it. And he said, OK. So I built it. Now, I was scrambling. I had this idea. So I, I broke the, the, the content down. I knew the material. I broke the content down so that I could generate approximately two 50-minute lectures, online videos. If I could get two up per week, for 13 weeks, I'm in the zone. I got this thing done. And so that was my mission. I had the first two done up and posted on Monday of the first day of classes. And I didn't have three and four. So I, I had one and two up, and I put up an assignment, an algorithmic assignment using this software. And uh, basically, I figured, OK, they got the notes. The assignment, I said, is due in one week. And I, I'm a deadlines guy, right? So I said, next Sunday night at midnight, that assignment has got to, it closes. So I worked really hard all week. I got lessons three and four up. And the next Monday morning at 9 o'clock, three and four went up. And then the next Monday morning, five and six. And when three and four went up, assignment two went up. And basically, what I, I didn't know what I was, I was just trying to survive, quite frankly. And what happened was, I, uh, I, I really got something good out of it. 
the students were all in the same place. They couldn't move ahead because I was giving them the lessons. They couldn't fall behind because they had these assignments. They had a one-week bubble everybody was operating in. The keeners were talking on the discussion boards with guys who were desperately trying to stay in the bubble. And everybody moved through the course. And that's my bubble message. That was got, what got me the President's Award. Work really, really good. right? Give them algorithmic tests. Encourage them to work together. Reward them but for discussing stuff. And tell them, listen, you all have the same questions, but you all have different numbers. I'm looking for people to explain it. And if you can't, I'll help you out. You know, that's, that's how it works. Asynchronous, that's what I'm doing now for some of my courses. We, start, we got all this stuff built. And what we do is uh, we basically put it up and let people run through it. I'm not a big fan of that one, to be honest with you. And then there's this thing called mastery, modified PSI. There's this thing called the Keller plan. Uh, I think it's William Keller, World War II, signals. Signals in World War II. They figured that was really, really important. If you're asking somebody to hit something with a mortar shell, calling in coordinates using Morse code, you want to be correct, OK? So what they did was they came up with this method where they would insist on mastery. They had an army of trainers, facilitators. What they would do is they would break the content up into discrete packages. They would give them the first package and say, go learn it. When you're ready, come back. And when they came back, they'd give them a test on it. If they passed the test, they got the second package and the third package. You didn't get to the next package until you demonstrated mastery with a high threshold of the package. Worked really, really well, but took an army to deliver it. Um, what happened was uh, these guys would uh, publish. So he was actually went on to educate. But what he found was he went on to, to get other people to try to do this thing. It screwed up. Some, some educational systems. There was a law school where they tried to teach a course in their degree using this Keller plan. And what they found was, well, if you, if you were willing to go through it and learn, you'd mastered everything by the end. And everybody graduated, they all had A's. And the management came down on them and said, you can't give everybody A's. This is law school. <laughs> so what the heck are you doing? Um, the fact is that the, if people are willing to do the work, they'll get through. Uh, learners who complete courses using a mastery mode of, less, of, of teaching, it is asynchronous. You can't fit it in a 13-week thir period. So it doesn't really work for a lot of our deliveries here. But People do very well. There's a lot of, of studies that, that demonstrate this. And, but the, the challenge was manpower restrictions. Now, the fact is, using these digital tools, we came up with what we call the modified Keller plan or personalized system of instruction, PSI. If anybody's interested in some references, I'll give them to you. But basically, this is what happens. I've actually did a slight modification of this. A student enters the course. They receive an online lecture. I'll show you that in a second. Um, they determine they're ready. If they're ready, they can attempt a maple quiz or assignment. If they get 80% on that, off they go. Um, and they can get, uh, whoop, where are you? 80%, yes. Reviews progress, releases module two. Right. And if you don't do well, basically back in you go, and you can get, have another test. We don't have to generate a million tests, because we've got the algorithmic quizzing now. I don't need, I've got online material that people can access and go back and hit again. And the instructor needs to be still involved to assess and help and determine where people need to work a little bit harder and maybe explain things further. But we've used this to success. As a matter of fact, some of the stuff we teach at the Marine Institute is mission critical. I mean, Exxon Valdez, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of things where you want people to get the right answer. 
right? Um, so this is actually a model we're using to teach mariners now uh, for critical uh, material. I'm going to quickly talk about something that just recently got on my radar and something which I am personally, in, in, I guess, imposing on my work. I always just build stuff to try to make it interesting, engaging. And to make it interesting, what we did was we make it so that you've got to do something. Remember I said I don't want, you, I don't want it to just play? There's this thing, the, mili the uh, American military in 1999, I believe, or 1997, came up with this IMI, Interactive Multimedia Index. It was modified in 2007. And in 1999, they had three levels, the first three that you see here. And basically, the first three, passive, click play and let it go. You can go to sleep, you can walk away, whatever happens. But that's level one. Level two, limited interaction. Something has to happen for it to proceed. If you're hitting a next button works. Uh, complex interaction is where you make choices. And there's outcomes of the choices. Right? There, there's, there's possible impact to how you proceed based on these choices. And then level four was introduced in 2007 to reflect the advancements in technologies like simulations and real-time like MMO style courses. Um, so, what I want to show you now are a few things that we've built and then we can have a discussion. So what I'm going to show you are the tools. Now we've built courses that incorporate these tools. Um, and actually, do I, I'm going to just, I, I, I've got to read this, if I may. Um, who here remembers the TV show Paper Chase? Yeah, I know. You remember Paper Chase? So in Paper Chase, it was a law school setting, and there was an instructor who would stand in a theater, which was circular, and had all these tiered seats which went up, and he had the names of the students with their photographs, and somebody would speak, and he'd, he'd look, and he'd find their, Mr. George! You know, and this is how he would go, right? And uh, now I'm speaking to the converted. You're here, right? You're here. You are people who have moved beyond the, the old school concept of lecture and now feel that the mission is to successfully teach. Millet, in talking about lecturing, uh, has quoted in Obstacles to Educational Reforms. Um, in 1985 says, and I, I, I'm going to put on my voice here now, okay? It is by all odds the easiest, being lecturing, the easiest of the educational techniques to apply. It demands no contact with the students' minds. It requires no adjustment to the students' knowledge or ignorance. In most institutions, it raises no questions as to whether or not the student has any desire to hear the lecture. It does not require any expertness in the techniques of question and answer, much less of genuine intellectual discussion. For the often insecure academic type, the lecture method is ideal for the establishment of not only a sense of security, but also a sense of superiority, since it assumes without examination that he or she is addressing their intellectual inferiors. The college furnishes the classroom and the audience and invests in the instructor or the faculty member with professional authority. Their task is to open the spigot of verbalism and to keep the stream flowing until or after the bell rings. Now, I've been talking for a half hour. So, let's do something. I'm going to ask you if you brought a device, if you haven't brought a device, I think we might have a cup. Do we have any left? Yeah. Let's get into bright space. And what I would like to say is the online technology, I originally say it empowers faculty to lecture, but I get rid of that after that. And I say instructors to instruct. How, people ask me, well, how do you, I'm not a member of MUNFA, by the way. Uh, MUN is uh, the Marine Institute. We're actually a part of NAEP, 
please don't leave now. This is where the good part comes. Uh, so we are instructors, and w originally had instructors to instruct, but instruction is really too, too surgical. And so what I say is it empowers teachers to teach. And I encourage everybody to teach. So let's see if I'm still in. I, oh, I've got one other slide I'm going to show you. Um, F5, shift F5. Now. When you go into Brightspace, I've set up 10 user accounts as, as theoretically you can have an infinite number of people in these um, Brightspace shells on a single account. But please pick a random number between 1 and 10. We've set up accounts. The usernames are all the same format. JT with capital JTL, JT Learner is 0, 1 to 10. And then the password is the same for all of them. And I'm going to leave this open and available if anybody's interested. And I'll even put more stuff in there if, you, if you'd like to see it. So I'll leave that up for just a minute, see if you can get in there. And now, I will warn you, some of this is narrated, <laughs> OK? So if that is the case, um, well, not if, if you're playing something that's narrated, you might want to, I'm loud. Um, so you might want to turn the volume down. or. How, listening to two of me is much worse than listening to one of me. Is it under a special heading? Uh, just log into Brightspace uh, and, and use. Oh, 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 oh! I know exactly what's going on. My apologies. Let me uh, show you. Um, let's see if I can get in here on another one. Yeah, I think what you got to do, if I may, if you look. Uh oh, let me log out. Uh, you, there's a little bright space only hyperlink underneath the big green login button. No, no, what I did was I logged in the library. Yeah, no, oh, no, you're no, pfft, no, okay, no problem. Really? I don't know. It, it should be the bright space only hyperlink. Like if you. Yeah, it should. Let me log out and show you where that is. Log out. Right here, Brightspace only login. That hyperlink right there is what you got to log into. I'll give everybody a second to get in there. And then we'll, I'll dance you through a few things. It won't work? Let me try this on mine. So capital J, T, capital J, capital T, capital L, E, A, R, N, E, R, 0, 3. And then the password is case sensitive. It's capital M, A, R, I, N, E, 2, 0, 1, 9. And then log in. What was the password again? Capital M. A R I N E is in Marine 2019. I'll, I'll show you the. the, the uh, yeah. Capital J, capital T, capital L. E A R. I will make it bigger. It could be any number between 1 and 10. I tried these yesterday, they worked. Seven worked? Well, I just logged in on one. Try another number if you could. I thought they all would work, but maybe, I don't know. Is everybody close to in? I should have got you in at the beginning. Yeah, there's a course in there. It's called WTMC space JT. I'm JT. Okay, so let's look at this as a student. And I'll show you a few things. Is, uh, can I move into the bright, the bright space now? All right. I'll click next. So you should see this screen right here. Oh, uh, that's great. OK. So enter the course, WTMCJT. We've got it dressed up a little bit. Thank you to uh, our technical support up at the Marine Institute. 
And I've got it zoomed in a little bit, but if the easy way to go is just click on course content. You guys are te they're instructors up here. You know how this works. Course content, that's where all the goodies are. And I'll show you a couple of things. And again, you all, please remember these credentials. Take, I'll give you a snap of it. I'm assuming you'll have a copy of the presentation. Let's start with an online class demonstration, shall we? Um, so this is just a, 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 a picture. I've got a couple of these. Now, they're inserted as SCORM objects. I'm going to start one. Um, now, SCORM. SCORM is a communication protocol. Basically, basically. Hello, and welcome to this demo of oh, thermodynamics. There, I told you I'd be talking. Class. To begin the course, click on the Begin the Course button. So I'm going to immediately mute myself. And what you'll see is this is not just a movie. Okay, it's actually a, uh, a, a, an interactive presentation. We've done a couple of things which are kind of cool with this. So I'm going to just say begin course and let this play. But I've put, the, the beauty of making this an interactive presentation is you can put, well, interactions on there. Mm -hmm. So if you're playing it, you can pause it. I've got a big invisible pause button. This is for people on phones, right? So you can slap this white portion of the screen with your finger and it will pause and play. Right? Now, in addition, I put another invisible button on here, which is down here in the footer. And I'll just show you that. That pops up a table of contents. Now, these are all just features of the software I use to build this. It's really not particularly complicated. But you can hop around to different parts of this. You can set this up so you can't hop to something until somebody has viewed it. Remember I said uh, you might want to make people watch things in a sequence, right? So there's all kinds of controls. But this is how I actually teach an applied math course. Uh, now, I've got the audio turned off. Uh, using Now, there's also these, remember I said how it's nice to now put these, these engagement questions in there, right? So certainly you can do things like multiple choice and fill in the blanks and drop downs. But I've taken to doing some things like this memory game. Now, in this course here, I talk about pumps, boilers, turbines, and condensers. It's a technical topic. My apologies. So how do you get that uh, table of contents to come up? Yeah, click on the gray bar button on the, bo the footer. Right there, like right down here. Look, it's it's white here because it doesn't look. It looks gray here. Um, so I'm going to go to the memory game, and then get rid of my foot, huh? And I'm going to play that now. So some of my engagements are intended to be kind of f fun. Um, oh, actually, I, there we go. And so this is timed. <laughs> and uh, the idea is you would open up a component, and then it would ask you a question until you get it right. And I, I so you just match it, right? that's all. That, that, I mean, it's, it's just that simple. The idea is to make it a bit of a, it's not worth anything. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. So, so that's one thing that we do. Um, so, and I, that is my lecture. That, that's how I, I, I open my verbal spigot and let it roll. Um, so let's go back to the uh, course content, and I'll show you something else. Uh, the next lecture. Now, I'll tell you, sometimes, and you know what? Sometimes you need the polish, you need the glitz, everything looks really good. Sometimes I need something really fast. Okay? So, uh, I was producing a lesson for an online course where we were talking about friction. And I said, you know, oh, ignore that. I said, uh, you know what? I said, it'd be really cool if we had, and I'm looking at the second lesson now, It'd be really cool if I could have a little video demonstration. Now, I'm just going to hop to the next one here so and let that play. So what I did was I went down with my buddy. That's uh, John Cross's arms. And he, I said, John, I want you to do this. And he said, OK. So we set this up in the lab. And then what I did, because I've got really short legs, I took a 
the little stool and I put it there, and then I put a chair, and then I had the, 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 the lab bench. And uh, you'll see this kick in in a, in, a, in a few seconds now. I'm here talking about this equation and this, this screen, uh, this graph. Anyway, what I did was I said, you do this. So I said, go. And I took the picture. And then basically, I, I walked in. And I tried to hold the phone steady. And I stepped up on the little stool and up on the chair and then up on the table. And, I, <laughs> I was, and that's how I took this video. And I can make these things start and stop. So basically, it's just like you do in a classroom is the idea. Uh, I'll just let this start. Now, are we 30 minutes in? Oh, gosh, 45 minutes in. OK. Uh, so as you